Today we're going to look, Lord willing, at three subjects. The first subject will be emunah, the Hebrew concept of faith. Our second subject will partly build on the first one. The second subject will deal with this idea of are these things mutually exclusive? Predestination, or is there a choice? Once saved, always saved, or can you fall away and lose your salvation? And then the third subject today, Lord willing, we shall be looking at Jehovah's Witnesses and using his faith here today. Should we come today? It's the weather. Um, my administrator, John Zari, was a uh, Jehovah's Witness over 20 years, and faith, I wish faith were here, she was, grew up in it. Um, there's a lot we can say about cult evangelism generally, and a lot more than we can say about Jehovah's Witnesses, but today we want to do something I've never quite done before. Uh, there's the fat sheep syndrome. Even good churches, with good Bible teaching, have the fat sheep syndrome. People get fed and fed and fed sometimes, they get fed the finest of grain by very good Bible teachers. I went to a Baptist church in New York as a young believer, and we have some of the finest Bible teachers in the world probably, like Stephen Olford and, and, and Alan Redpath and these people, and Donald Hubbard, they were really good Bible. They weren't open to gifts of the Spirit, while well, some of them were somewhat open, but they really knew the Word of God. They were some of the finest Bible teachers you'd ever find anywhere in the world. And on Easter Sunday, this church, Calvary Baptist Church in New York, across from Carnegie Hall, has two services. Every other Sunday, there's a morning service and a night service, except Easter Sunday, there's two services. Because for born again Christians who come to church once a year at Easter time. And the matter of the people are trying to show up with spring fashion there, people by the outfit and they have this thing Easter parade on Fifth Avenue, it's like Oxford Street in London, they make it big. These were Christians. It was basically, while there were some very good people in the church and some good things about the church, and there were some zealous Christians in the church, basically it's the church of Laodicea. It was a lukewarm church. Yet those people knew better because they were fed the best. They were given top grade Bible teaching, but it made practically no difference in their lives. Some people called me from Worcester yesterday and said, Every time you come, it stirs the church up in Worcester, but once you leave, it makes no difference. There's that thing in Ezekiel. What you say will just be as music, it will be a dirge, a pleasant song to people's ears, it will entertain them, but it will have no impact. That's no good. The Word of God is not given to increase our knowledge, but it's given to change our lives and to enable us to be used by the Lord to change other people's lives. It's no good if you're just a fat sheep. So when we get these handouts today, I would like to try something. We're going to A, pray for Jehovah's Witnesses in this area. And B, every household is going to phone up or write to the nearest senior hall and say, I've got some copies of Watchtower magazine and I have some questions. Can you send someone over who can answer them on the I'm interested in the Bible and I've got some of the literature and I've got a Bible, but I'd like to put them in some over. And they'll come over, and then you'll see what will happen. It's great fun. Don't be afraid. So often, I've met, I've met Christians, even Christians have been saved a while. When those poor people knock on the door, they get nervous. They say, I'm a Christian. Quick, close the door. <laughs> Jehovah's Witnesses are nothing to be afraid of. People to be pitied, nothing to be afraid of. Many of the people who get stuck up into any cult, including that one, are people who have heard the gospel. The church wasn't so lukewarm. If Christians were zealous for the truth that these cults are of a lie, they might have to say it. We'll talk more about that in the third session. But right now, let's go to the Lord in prayer, and then we'll be looking at Emunah, the Hebrew concept of faith. Heavenly Father, we just Thank you for all of your goodness to us and your kindness that you give us through Jesus who died for our sins. We thank you, Lord God, for his cross and for his resurrection. We thank you for your Holy Spirit that appropriates his death and his life to us. Be with us all, Lord God. Renew our hearts and minds continually by your Spirit. Wash us all continually with the blood of your Son, Jesus. 
Help us all to die continually with him, that we might live continually and forever with him and with you. Bless these meetings today, Lord God. Give me clarity of thought, but above all, anointing by your spirit, for words mean nothing unless they bear the option of your spirit, Lord God. Let these people have ears to hear, minds to understand, and above all, hearts to comprehend and to grasp and to live out the truth of your words. Be with us now, Lord God, in Jesus' name, for Jesus' sake. Open our eyes to your words. Most Christians that I know have some ideas about faith that don't exactly make a lot of sense. A lot of Christians that I know, I would say most Christians I know, don't really understand much of what the Bible actually means by faith. For one thing, most Christians, I would say, certainly most charismatics and Pentecostals like myself, would confuse the word faith with at least three other English words. They would confuse faith with hope. I believe, I believe, I hope it's true. I believe, I believe, I hope it's going to get I believe, I believe, I hope it's The second thing, many, if not most, charismatic and Pentecostals like myself, confused faith with, is belief. I believe. I believe. I believe. Like the Southern Baptist. The minister took him down to the creek in Kentucky to baptize him. He took him under the water, pulled him out. Do you believe? Yes, Reverend, I believe. Puts him back under. <laughs> Hold him up. Do you believe? Yes, Reverend, I do believe. Puts him back under and pulls him up again. Do you believe? Reverend, I believe you're trying to drown me. <laughs> we confuse faith with belief. Now, in addition to confusing it with hope, and confusing it with belief, we confuse it with trust. With trust. Now, in fact, emunah, the bi- biblical Hebrew idea of faith, in which the Greek words, or the main Greek word, Tisto, is translated from, contains elements of all those things. It contains elements of hope. However, the hope is a different definition than we have in English. The Hebrew word tikva. It contains elements of belief, and elements of it. And it contains an element of in addition to those, it contains an element of trust. But the main Greek word that translates the Hebrew word, and we'll look at the Hebrew second, is pistis, pistis, and variation of First of all, look with me please at Matthew 24, 45. Matthew 24, 45. Who is the good and faithful servant who gives the proper food at the proper time? Now that deals with a separate subject than the one we're dealing with today. Nonetheless, faithful. The word for Greek for faithful and faith is the same word. The Greek word, the original word for faith and faithful is the same word. Are we saved by faith? Yes, by pistis. Faithfulness. He who perseveres to the end shall be saved. You understand? Not work righteousness. Pistis means faithfulness. 
not just faith, it may mean is steadfastness, faithfulness. Remember when Jesus talked about the, the widow who kept asking, the persistence. You don't have faith! <laughs> no. Sometimes when God doesn't answer prayer, it's not because the person doesn't have what they think they do. It's because they don't have what the Bible says they do. Faithfulness. If somebody is not being faithful to what they already have, why should God give them anything more? He who is faithful in little is faithful in much. Lord, I need a hundred thousand pounds. Lord, I'm asking you in faith. I need for your work and for your ministry. You know I need this money, Lord. I have to have a hundred thousand pounds on the Wednesday. I'm asking you in faith. No. Are you asking in peace? Are you asking in faithfulness? In other words, what did you do with the 10,000 I gave you last month? Lord, I need a thousand pounds by the end of this week. Okay, what did you do with the hundred I gave you last week? Were you faithful with what you have? Were you faithful a little? Is faithful in much? When you ask in faith, biblically, it doesn't mean you ask with the certainty. And that's it. It means you act in faithfulness. In faithfulness. Now, think about it. What happens when people act but they don't act in faithfulness? Let's look at the epistle of James. Chapter 4, verse 3. You ask and do not receive because you ask with wrong motives, so that you may spend it on your pleasure. You can ask me what you think faith is, but you're not asking me what the Bible says faith is. If you ask with the wrong motive, you're not asking in faithfulness, so you're not asking in faith. Just believe, just believe, just believe God. Believe God, and you have guys in the state, some of these guys, and trust very people. And some of them are ridiculous. And Kagan, Copeland, all these guys, Frederick Christ. We talk about faith. Just believe that, and if you don't get it, something wrong with your faith. Uh, no, but if you don't get it, there might be something wrong with your faithfulness. If you ask with wrong motives, don't expect God to give it to you. Now let's look what happens when we ask with right motives. What does it say in John's epistle? If we ask anything according to his will. If you're asking in faithfulness, you're asking with right motives. What is right motives? Father, let this cup pass from me. I don't want this, Jesus said. But your will be done, not mine. Even if the worst thing happens, even if everything goes to the wall, I'm going to trust and believe you anyway. Because you are faithful. When you ask with right words, you can always accept that God doesn't answer the prayer because he has something better. But when God does not answer a prayer, prayed in faith, it's always because he has something better. Moses wanted to enter the promised land. He desperately wanted to enter the promised land. God prepared him his whole life to lead the people out of Egypt. He grew up in Pharaoh's court. Remember, Moses had the wisdom of Pharaoh in Egypt before he had the wisdom of God. Paul had the wisdom of man before he had the wisdom of God. The wisdom of man is foolishness to God. But Jesus talked openly about knowing the world's ways and the mentality. The innocent doesn't serve it. Why is it done? If somebody is not wise in the ways of the world, 
They're never going to properly understand the superior wisdom of God. But it's the naive people. Jesus never called us to be naive. He called us to be wise people. Wise is the serpent. Wise is the serpent. Serpent is Satan, the seducer, isn't it? Revelation in Genesis. Moses had the wisdom of Egypt before he had the wisdom of God. And he wanted to enter the promised land. And God told him, no. And he said, God, I, my whole life, I've led these people, you're not going to let me enter. And God said to Moses, speak no more to me about this matter. But that was a prayer offered in faith. Real faith. Faithfulness. Because, at a much later point, many centuries later, we saw Moses walking in the land with the Lord Jesus the Messiah. God may not answer a prayer offered in faith the way we want, or the way we expect, or even when we expect. But when he doesn't, it's only because he has something better. And nothing will prevent that from happening, not even death. A prayer offered in faith, will it be answered? Yes. On God's terms, in his way, in his time, not ours. If it doesn't happen when we need it, or when we think we need it, it's only because God has something better. Look at Moses. There's one thing Moses wanted more than to enter the promised land. That was to see the salvation of Israel that they were going at to receive. And he walked in that land with Jesus. God answered that prayer, even though he died. Even if a child of God dies with unanswered prayers, those prayers will in one way, one day, be fulfilled. Now, premillennialism we can allow for that. Even if history be fulfilled, a millennialism which is unbiblical anyway, you can't allow for it. Nonetheless, let's continue. Faith is faithfulness. However, the good and faithful servant had faith because he was faithful. But our faithfulness is unfaithful. I don't know to put it that way. Look at Revelation chapter 1, verse 5. And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth, he has dominion, to him who loves us and release us from our sins by his blood. Because of our sin, we are unfaithful. Because of our sin, we are incapable of faith, because we're incapable of faithfulness. The same word. It's only once Jesus releases us from the power of sin that we are capable of true faith. Because it's only once He releases us from the power of sin we're capable of faithfulness. In other words, faith is God's initiative. And it's based on the faithfulness of Jesus, not us. Faith is God's initiative. It's based on the faithfulness of Jesus, not us. We have these terrible Gnostic lies being propagated today. It's not Jesus who heals you, says Frederick Christ. It's your faith. That is a lie. The word faith teaching of Copenhagen, Yumi Chow, these people, make man's servant, man's servant and God, God, reversed. God becomes the servant and man becomes the God. Gnostic people will always be a fine man or something. So they get the Gnostic formula, the secret of faith. You've got to get the secret, the Gnostic secret that God showed Copeland and Hagen to you. Once you tap into the secret, then you have the word faith. You can speak into things that are not the way Jesus did. God created the world with a spoken word. Once you have the faith, you can do it. God created the world by faith. Who has done that faith? <laughs> himself? Okay, he has faith in himself. I can accept that. He's the only one who cannot faith in himself. If we have faith in ourselves, we're in trouble because we're fallen. He can have faith in his son Jesus because 
He didn't sin. Faith is God's initiative. Faithfulness comes from Jesus. Our capacity for faith and faithfulness has to be built and predicated upon him and upon what he did. Frederick Christ is wrong when he says that it's not Jesus who heals you with your faith. No, it is Jesus who heals you. These people are not teaching faith in God. They're not teaching faith in Jesus. They're teaching faith in faith. They are not teaching faith in God or faith in Jesus. They're teaching faith in faith. The faith becomes this power which becomes somehow deified in itself. You can control. This is other conditions. But it's the core of what is going on today in so much of Pentecostalism and Charismaticism. Utterly, utterly absurd. But that's what's going on. Let's look further. Now we're going to look mainly at the Jewish books of the New Testament. All of them kept the Jewish book, but there are certain books written to Jewish believers and written from a Jewish perspective. Of the Gospels, Matthew and John are the most Jewish. James and Peter and Hebrews are the most Jewish in their orientation. They were written to Jewish believers. So mainly looking at those and also a bit at Galatians which deals with the subject of Judaism and so on. So let's look first of all at Matthew chapter 8, verse 10. Truly I say to you, Jesus said, I have not found such great faith with anyone in Israel. I have not found such great faithfulness. The same words... In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says, Knock and it shall be opened, seek and you shall find, ask and it shall be given. Now what the devil would do in the temptation of Jesus was that the devil would take one verse or one passage in isolation. He'd take a verse out of context or he would take the passage in isolation from the overall book of Deuteronomy. And say the servants do the same thing. I take a verse out of context, and then they take it in isolation from the overall passage and the overall book of Timothy. So read this bit about faith, asking you shall receive, or what they think is about faith, in isolation from the rest of what Matthew says about it, and from the rest of what the rest of the New Testament says about it. I have not found such great faith, no, it's also. I've not found such great faithfulness. Faith. If anyone believes in the Son, John 3.36, he who believes in the Son has eternal life, right? But he who does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God rests upon him. John 3.36, he who believes in the Son, I have faith, I believe. But if it's real faith, it's faithfulness. You act on it. The devil believes it. The devil believes it. There's unsaved people who believe it. No. That's not the kind of faith the Bible teaches. Faith. Faithfulness. What's the saying, James? Faith without works is... It's not real faith. So much of what you see today is not real. Now, Paul tells us directly that people who want to get rich in this world, like Robert Tilton and these other false prophets and false teachers, this the gospel to the world. People who want to get rich in this world will lose that faith. Far from David and Crane, the Bible says people who want to get rich will lose that faith. When persecution comes, when hard time comes, who's the first ones who lose their faith? Those who were taught a false definition of it by false teachers. Faith and faithfulness is the same word. 
He who believes in the Son has eternal life. Believes. But he who does not obey the Son shall not see life. But the life of God rests upon him. Faith without works is dead. Matthew 8, I've not seen such great faithfulness. Let's look at Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. You remember, of course, when Abraham believed, God reckoned it to him as righteousness, right? But, he acted on it. Get up and go to this land I show you. He put her into action. He was faithful. He didn't just have faith as we would define faith. He had faith as the Bible defines it. It's something he acted on. Galatians, chapter 2, verse 20. I have been crucified with the Messiah. It's no longer I who live, but the Messiah who lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and delivered himself up for me. I live by faith. Same word, I live by faithfulness to Jesus. When you see somebody who goes without any money in their pocket to go be an evangelist in some country of the world, and God told them to do it. God says, I don't want you to ask any support or join a mission agency. I don't want you to do that. I just want you to go and trust me for your needs. We call that living by faith. God's not interested in that. He's interested in living by faithfulness. If you're going to be faithful to what he told you to do, his faithfulness will assure that you are taken care of. Totally different in our way of thinking. Now look what he says here. The life I live, I live by faith, or I live by faithfulness. What does he say? I've been crucified with Christ, his old nature. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Now we have people today teaching over-realized eschatology. The Bible says, we shall be as he is. You know how it is justification, sanctification, redemption. I do say I've been justified. Even though I'm evil, Jesus saved me, and I'm justified by his righteousness. I've been saved. I'm being saved. Being made holy, being sanctified. I'm going to be saved. Lift up your head for your redemption draws nigh. The down payment has been made, the Holy Spirit is depressed and earnest. We shall be saved. We've been saved, we're being saved, we're going to be saved. I've been crucified and resurrected with Christ, I'm being crucified and resurrected every day, I'm living a Christian life, faithfulness, and I'm going to be crucified and resurrected with Christ, or somehow by it, it becomes present. It's past, present, and future. Now, he lived it by faith. No, he grieved, he spoke, he lived it by faithfulness. If somebody is not picking up their cross and dying to themselves and struggling to overcome the flesh, not in their own power, but the power of the cross, the power of Jesus, if they are not abiding in Christ, living a crucified life, they're not living in faith because they're not living in faith. We shall be as he is. One of the most frightening things I've ever encountered was when Morris Cirillo stood up and said, you're not looking at Morris Cirillo, you're looking at Jesus Christ. Now, Paul said, Christ lives in me and through me, but he never said, you're looking at Jesus. We should see Christ in him. But it doesn't mean Paul stopped being Paul. When we get to heaven, you're not going to stop being you. You're going to be conformed to the image of Christ, the first born of many sons, but you're not going to stop being you. Look at Moses, look at the transfiguration. The transfiguration is one of the main things that teaches us about our eternal future. Christ was transfigured into a strife. Moses was a man who died faithful to God, and Elijah was a man who was raptured, who was never died. They all appeared exactly the same. Moses 
who died looked exactly like Jesus. They are of the same nature as this one. And Elijah, who was raptured, looked the same. It doesn't matter if you die in Christ, or if you're alive when he comes and you get raptured. It doesn't matter. We'll all look the same. But Elijah was Elijah. Moses was Moses. And Jesus was Jesus. They were as he was. And his life was in them to take us to them. Peter wanted to build three foods. Cirillo says, you're not looking at Mara Cirillo, you're looking at Jesus Christ. What did Jesus warn about in Matthew 24? Many will come in my name saying, I am This is the same guy, of course, with the 25 pound Holy Ghost here behind us that guarantees to take away all debt. Because if he exploits Christian single mothers and other such people. A false Christ will come into these men. What is a false Christ? False Mashiach, Messiah. What does that mean in Greek? Simply someone with a false anointing. That's all false Christ means in Greek is someone with a false anointing. Doesn't mean they have an anointing, it's that they're false. False Christ will come. Many will come and say, I am he. Jesus warned about people like Shavala. Many repent, I believe he really was a man of God. May God keep the rest of us from going that way. Now, let's look at James chapter 1, verse 3. Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials. Consider it all joy when you encounter various trials. As a young believer, I made a stupid mistake. When I was newly saved, there was a lot of things I never even thought about before. A lot of things. I didn't know too much. I just knew that the Bible was God's word, that Jesus was the truth, that religion was a con job, and that Jesus saved me. He was the thing I was always looking for. I told my head the only thing else. My friends, they thought I was crazy. My parents, they already, they, they already knew I was crazy. <laughs> and sometimes I thought I was crazy. I wasn't too sure about anything, but I was sure about Jesus, and I was sure that the Bible was God's word. And I used to read it. And you know that thing, my people perish for lack of knowledge? People can get in trouble by misunderstanding the scriptures. He was a very intelligent man, but you think about Tolstoy, Leon Tolstoy, the Russian writer. He knew that the Eastern Orthodox Church was corrupt and hypocritical and not the Christianity of the New Testament. So he read the New Testament. And despite his tremendous intellectual ability in a number of fields, including languages, he would just take it too literally. And the guy was, uh, he left this bad understanding because he misunderstood the context and the background about what Jesus was saying. And if you don't take the parents of him. He just took it like that. I remember in London Bible College, we had these believers who were involved in, you know, they weren't open doors, but there was some other organization involved in China, and they were telling us about the problems going on in China. These people had no leaders, no teaching. They only had fragments of the New Testament in many cases that were copied by hand or something like this. And there were people that were cutting their eyes out, chopping their hands off. Because they didn't know. How do people perish for lack of knowledge? Well, I didn't go that far. What I mean is an understandable mistake, I guess, in their context, their, their situation. When I used to read this thing in James, counted as all trials, I used to pray for trials. I really used to fast and pray for trials. I wish God answered all of my prayers as quickly as the answer goes. <laughs> Man, that's what I call service. <laughs> I wouldn't recommend it, but I'll tell you what, God was able to clean stuff out of my life overnight by doing it that would have taken a long time otherwise. But I still wouldn't recommend it. Put it this way, if you pray for trials, you're going to get them. You won't have to pay. More than likely. Now, the faith life. Trials. 
Trials are part of the faith life. If you're living by faith, you're living by faithfulness to Jesus. And trials are part of the faith life. Why? So God will know if we're really faithful. God already knows. He wants us to know. Will we be able to stand up under difficult circumstances and be used by God to help others? And a persecution or something? God already knows that we can do that. He wants us to know. He wants us to know. And he'll even use the devil for his own purposes. And Isaiah, Satan is called God's servants. Even things we would call attacks to the devil, God allows it. He allows it for his purpose. Just look at the crucifixion. God allowed them to, God used the devil for his own purpose. It's like a, a gambit playing chess. You let someone take your knight so you can turn around and take their queen. If you're a good chess player, the devil the master chess player, but God's a better one. Now let's look at First Peter, chapter one, verse seven. That the proof or the genuineness, as the Greek rendering really, of your faith being more precious than gold, which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Over at Walsall, we talked about how diamonds are forged by, formed by pressure and forged by fire. The only thing in the Bible the literal crystal is more precious than gold are the diamonds. Now it says in Proverbs that the bride is the crown of her husband's head. In the book of Revelation, we read that the crown of the crown is many crowns. Jesus is his crown. The church is his crown in glory. In the setting of gold, are these diamonds worth more than the gold. In other words, the church is to be the glory of Christ. And how did he make this crown? Gold is purified by fire, but even more precious than the diamonds. The pressure and the fire are what forms it. He's continually getting rid of our old nature so that the new creation can come forth. Real faith will always be tested. Now, Forget about this, my body's lying to me stuff. Just confess the healing and it still hurts. Or if your fingers are falling off, if you have leprosy, that's your body lying to you. This comes not from the Word of God. That does not come from the Word of God, it comes from Christian science. From Mary Baker Eddy. Christian science is neither Christian nor scientific. I studied science in secular university, I studied theology in Bible college. I can tell you Christian science is neither scientific nor Christian. She believes sickness was an illusion. She believed old age was an illusion. She believed death was an illusion. Poor Mary Baker Eddy. First she fell victim to the illusion of old age. Then she fell victim to the illusion of sickness. And then, voila, la grande illusion. <laughs> The founders of the faith movement draw on E.W. Kenyon. The whole Jesus side spiritually thing as they define it. Becoming a satanic being in hell, the atonement wasn't on the cross and all this stuff. Another gospel. He admitted that he was influenced by Christian science. Mary Baker Eddy. Now in fact, Christian science was a do. Things like that existed in Eastern religious philosophy and theosophy for centuries, these things are the new age today. They're in a lot of things. They've always been around, but she simply crystallized it in a way for her time, which we today call Christian science. Kenyon 
Und man kommt von den Hegel, die gar nicht gibt, die Sache, die hat es von ihm, wo er geht es von her, Blumen. Real faith will be tested. When Jesus was hanging on the cross, was his body lying to him? Father, let this cup pass from him. Was his body lying to him when they... God has a definition of faith which is faithfulness. He never promises to rescue us out of a trial. God never promises to rescue us out of a crisis. He never promises to rescue us out of a wilderness. He never promises to rescue us out of a valley experience. He never promises to deliver us out of any of those things because of our faith. He promises to be with us in it and deliver us through it. The children of Israel went through the same Red Sea, whatever it was, the reason we one say, as the Egyptians. Only the Egyptians perished because God's people go through it. Faith is faithfulness. God doesn't deliver us out of these things. He delivers us through them. When these terrible things happen, it's always for purpose to make our faith like something more precious than gold. We live in Western democracy. By the grace of God, this society, for all of its faults, was founded by people who were influenced by the Word of God. So was the United States, so was other Western countries. And Walter heard me say the reason that we're losing our freedom and the reason our society and our social fabric is disintegrating is because we've turned our backs on the word of God and the God of the word. Western Protestant countries are backslid and now God is working in Asia, in Africa, and South America. What happened here in the earlier centuries, now God is working in the poor countries and in the Roman Catholic East and all the black countries, not the Protestant countries. Places like Brazil and Kenya and places like this. Now, the freedom, not to mention the answers that we have in Great Britain, is a historical anomaly. Most born-again Christians in most places throughout most of history were to varying degrees persecuted and very often terribly persecuted, including this one. The reason we have the freedom to meet in a place like this in the name of Jesus and to study his word is because people were martyred to pay for it. Because Tyndale died to give us this freedom. Because John Beth Bunyan was, was chained to the wall of the desert to give us this freedom. Because John Wycliffe's father was a law lord who hunted down and murdered by the Roman Catholic Church to give us this freedom. So now that we have this freedom, we take it for granted and we say, because of our faith, we don't have to suffer. <laughs> no, because of the faith of our fathers, who are willing to die to give us this freedom, because of their faith, we don't have to suffer. You understand? Faithfulness. Go to Nigeria. Northern Nigeria, the Christians are terribly persecuted, often murdered by the Muslim tribes in North of like Nigeria. The British government allowed Saudi Arabia and Kuwait to build mosques all over this country, to finance the construction of mosques all over Great Britain. Those Islamic countries, which have built the religious and citadel, will not allow one church to be built in Saudi Arabia and Kuwait. Politicians in this country who meet in a building that says, Our Father and Lord in Heaven, automatically is the chariot from the outside. Parliamentary democracy, founded under the influence of others. The Puritans who have a biblical idea of government, to all have the same thoughts. They're in there now, and let them lift the finger. They won't lift the finger to say anything about the fact that when a Christian or so called Christian becomes a Muslim in England, it's all right. But when a Muslim becomes a Christian in Saudi Arabia, he says, What am I to cut off? What is the shot that I'm losing you now? 
For me, what does the Bible say? Our freedom is because of faith, real faith, the faithfulness of the people who gave it to us, the people who are martyred. The Christians in Nigeria have real faith because they have faithfulness. They love not their lives in this world, even unto death. They didn't get the right of some of the things they did in the Job was a disgusting and carnal man. He said that. He said that. He supposedly repented of a lot of these things. And I saw a video of him where he was basically repackaging and teaching the people like Moses. However, if somebody repented, but somebody who had such crazy ideas as never say, Thy will be done when you pray, and insult the God to say, Thy will be done, as Jesus said we should say, or that there's nine persons in the Trinity, or that uh, Job was a disgusting part of man, or that I wish I could find one person in the Bible that if anybody else would agree with me, I could just go out and kill him. If somebody like that would tempt to get out of the ministry and go learn the word of God, and not come back to the ministry because God sent them back. But in fact, it's not only did not do that. When he said things which are just as heretical since his so called repentance, and thirdly, he continues to work the ministry of people like Marshall and Shalom and so on. I'd like to believe, maybe I do believe, that any human of a sincere man who's just misled. Nonetheless, there's a real faith. Faithfulness. Let's look further. Real faith will always be tested. Galatians chapter 6, verse 10. So then, while we have opportunity, let us do good to all men, and especially to those who are the household of faithfulness. So, faithfulness. The household of faith, no, the household of faithfulness. God does not make the distinction. The Bible doesn't make the distinction. The Hebrew language doesn't make the distinction, nor does the Greek language make the distinction. We do. 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 5 Very Jewish book Who are protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time Through faith through peace though through faithfulness Our eternal destiny and what happens when Jesus comes back will preserve Unto it, kept unto it through faithfulness. You understand how this affects one's faith, always faith. Let's look further. 1 John chapter 5, verse 4. For whatever is born out of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world. Our kisto. Our faithfulness. Our faith, our faithfulness. If your faith is real, you'll be faithful. There is no distinction in God's economy between faith and faithfulness. Your act on what you've done. Now we're saved by grace through faith. This again ties in with the next session. We're saved by faith, but by faithfulness. We can do nothing to save ourselves, but we have to act on what God has done for us. I'll explain this more in the next one. We have variations of faith. Oligopistos means little faith in Matthew 6.30. Look what it says. But if God 
hard summer rains, the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the furnace, will he not much more do so for you, O men of little faith? No. Will he not much more do for you, O men of little peace, though, faithfulness? In other words, when you understand what the word means in Greek and the way that Jesus uses it, he probably used an Aramaic word, translate it. God treats us better than we deserve to be treated. You are a little faithful. I know that Jesus treats me a lot better than my behavior and my life in the Christian world. His mercy, his blessing, his putting up with me, lifting me up when I fall, his being faithful when I am not faithful, which is very often unfortunately. He treats me better than I should be treated. Oh, you of little Christo, faithful, you're a man of little Christo, of little faithfulness. Let's continue. Oligo Christos is a little faith. No faith is Atta. Christos. A Christos. Look at Matthew 17 17. And Jesus answered and said, O oh, believing and perverted generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring him here to me. O oh, unbelieving generation. The word there is apistos. It means not just not believing as we did. It means not having faithfulness. Not being faithful. The people will not be faithful, but God will have to their hearts. When you see people who quickly grow despondent as Christians in times of crisis in their lives, the people who are the first and the quickest to grow despondent are the ones that that's almost a sure of their faithfulness. The people who have real faithfulness to Jesus will not be the ones who suffer the crisis of that. The people who are not so faithful in their relationship with Jesus, that will be much more inclined to suffer the price of God during the time of high pressure or something like that. The people who wouldn't despair, the first and the quickest, will be the ones who have not been faithful. The people who are faithful, they don't fall for so many. Keep them. Faith, faithfulness. So let's look further. Revelation 2.13 And because my witness was killed, my faithful one, That's the same word, is faithfulness, abiding. Abiding, continually faithful. It's the same word used in Revelation 21.5. Write these words. These words are faithful and true. The word of God is faithful and true. The same as God's word is faithful, a Christian of faith will be faithful. Antipas was martyred. Why? For his faith. But he was faithful. What do you make out of people who say, we don't have to suffer, and if you suffer, it's because you don't have faith? Well, Jesus said Antipas was a man who had faith. He was a man of faithfulness. Where did they get this? It's totally logical, isn't it? I'll tell you where they get it. They get it from the pit of hell. They get it from the way Satan is mishandled scripture. One verse out of context and in isolation from the other 
places the scripture speaks on the subject. These guys just get theology from the pit of hell. That goes to Ray Macaulay's church in South Africa, and in culture, and in Canada, that theology comes from the pit of hell. Now remember, Satan is a sandwich maker. He doesn't tell out and out lies. He's much too clever. He's much too clever. What did he do with the temptation of Jesus? He didn't say something totally false. He's too shrewd for that. He distorts something that's true. What did he do when he tempted me? Did he say something totally false? No. He twisted something that was true. Your eyes will be open. You'll be like God. You'll make a law unto yourself. Yeah, you will. You'll also fall. Okay. Manchester. She said, what's wrong with Kenneth Daniel? I have a book on faith. Show me one thing wrong with him. I said, open to any page in any chapter. She opens. She says, yeah, I'll read it. She says, faith sees the answer. I showed her the Bible. We walk by faith, not by sight. The Bible says, faith doesn't have to see the answer. Who am I going to believe? Ken Colton? Jesus Christ. Well, yeah, I can see that, but... But there's other true things in it. Yeah, I know. Of course there was true things in it. There's true things in Mormonism. There's true things in Jehovah's Witness. There's true things in Norman Catholicism. There's true things in Spirit. There's true things in the There's true things in it. A lot of truth to get you to swallow the bait. Or not the bait, you swallow the bait. There's always real cheese in the rat trap. Rodney Brown says, oh, true. There's always real cheese in the rat trap. Antipas was martyred for his faith. And the Lord acknowledges his faithfulness. Now, much of what we call faith in the Bible is not faith at all. It is the Hebrew word, tikva, or the Greek word, ethics. Hope. Not only do we have a wrong definition or a wrong understanding, at least, of faith, in English, the way we translate it and understand it, semantically and so on, we have a wrong definition of hope. Patikva, the hope. Patikva, hope and hope. Hope in the Bible Atheists, keep back. Biblical faith means future fact. Biblical faith means future fact. It is a future fact that unless Jesus comes first, which is entirely possible, I am going to die someday. So I'm going to die someday. That's a future fact. Unless Jesus comes. One way or another. It is a future fact that a pregnant lady is going to have to give birth to a baby. That's a fact. She doesn't have the baby yet, but yes, she does. It's already there. It's a fact. Future fact. And the way we think about faith is that we confuse it with hope. As biblically defined. Look at Hebrews 10.23. Hebrews 10.23. Hebrews 10.23. Hebrews 10.23. Hebrews 10.23. Hebrews 10.23. Do you notice how much of confusion and false doctrine can be very easily cleared up if you simply look at the original text in the original context in the original language and see what these words mean in the original the whole thing with curses is like that. <coughs> Taking it on curses, all this confusion about curses, when you list the curses, and you see what kind of curses Christians can be under, and what kind they can't, the different words in Greek, it clears up at least 90%, at least 80%, if not 90%, of the confusion. You don't have to be a Greek or Hebrew scholar to learn a basic amount of Greek and Hebrew to learn 
how to use a lexical commentary. Any person of average intelligence with a little training and, 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 a, and a bit of practice can learn to use lexical commentaries. Now, I'm fortunate that I speak these, and my family speaks it. I went to Bible college, and I learned some more about grammar and things like this. But for the most part, you don't need that stuff. For the most part, the commentaries, the lexical, not the ordinary commentaries, but the lexical books are so good that if you know the basics, and you have a basic working vocabulary of Greek and Hebrew, and you know just the basic ideas of how the grammar works, and you can use the academic commentaries, the lexical ones, that if there's something you need to know technically, you can get it from the commentaries. Anybody, any minister should be able to do that or it shouldn't be a minister. But the average Christian can still get an analytical concordance and see what these words actually mean and where else the original words are used in the text. Any Christian can do that. Anybody, anybody of average intelligence, within one hour's time, I can teach them how to, 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 use, an, to, to use an analytical concordance and compare words. And it's the two again and all this kind of stuff. How does it, the Old Testament Greek translated to the Old Testament. One hour I can show anybody in radical intelligence the basics. A minister should be able to at least use lexical commentaries, at least read what, what the academics say, what the legal scholars say in the Bible. If he should, can't do that, he shouldn't be a minister. So much of this stuff can be cleared up simply by giving priority to the original languages and the original meaning and the original text. But of course, that's being gotten away from. Again, I always point to the case of David Sherman, the assembly of the God Pastor of Nottingham. So the signs of statement, forget about it, we shouldn't get into the debate about the clever language of the Greek, we should only accept what it means for us in the simple vernacular. In other words, forget what Matthew meant, forget what, what, what the Holy Spirit meant when he inspired Matthew to write it, we're just going to take our English definitions. Well, the English definition of hope is totally different than the biblical one. And if you have the English definition of hope, you're saying, my hope is in Jesus. I hope, I hope he loves me. I hope, I hope when he comes back, he's, he's gonna save me. I, 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 I hope he saves me. I, I hope, oh, I, I hope it's the truth. I hope I'm not going to hell. I hope it's the heaven. You take the biblical idea, if you follow David Sherman's formula, that's what you're gonna want to help with. Hey God, go to the original language. What does it say in Nehemiah chapter, uh, 8? The people who knew Hebrew, after the captivity of the people speaking out there, translated from the original Hebrew to give the people the exact meaning. Let's look further. We are calling faith hope. Uh, hope is hope and faith is faith. As we present this in peace, though, in peace. Hebrews 10, 23. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. Do you see faithful, peaceful, and empress used together? The Bible not only always associates in the New Testament faith with faithfulness, those are interchangeable, they're interchangeable synonymous. Virtually the way they use. But, are almost synonymous, but certainly they're, they're, they're inextricably linked. Faith is associated with hope. Peace thought is associated with ethics. Because hope in the Bible is a future fact. I have faith in something. I have faith that Jesus is coming because it's a future fact. The same as I have faith that baby is going to be born. The same as I have faith, you know, that, that, it's gonna, that the sun's going to set tonight. It's a future fact. I have faith in it. We'll come back to this. We have two other words for faith. Pistoma comes from Pisto, so it's really only a variation of it. Look at Acts 17, 4. And some of them were persuaded. That word meaning faith, or pistos, pisto much in Greek, and joined Paul and Silas. You see what it says they were persuaded? They believed it was true, so what did they do? 
They acted on it, right? Faith and faithfulness. Faith is action. Faith, real faith is action. You ask in faith or you ask in faithfulness. But then we have another word, totally different, called pito. Pito. It means to persuade. To persuade. Now, I read this in the step two again. I always like to go and look how the Greek translates the New Testament, how the Old Testament works. Let's look at 1 Kings 22-22. And the Lord said to him, how? He said, I will go out and be a deceiving spirit in the mouth of all his prophets. Then he said, go out and entice him and also prevail. Go and do so. The demon persuaded somebody. We think of faith as being, having been persuaded something is true. Again, that's only an aspect. Because we're persuaded something is true, it doesn't mean it is. Not only can a demon deceive, but as we see here in this passage, God can even allow it, and in some sense, commission it to deceive. Can it? What does it say about those who do not love the knowledge of the truth in the New Testament? That's what the Lord himself will send on them a delusion, so they might believe what is false. They might be persuaded something is true and it isn't. If somebody wants to Harden their heart and they keep hardening it. God will harden their heart like he did to Pharaoh. Once Pharaoh hardened his own heart and kept doing it, then God hardened his heart. What's it say in John's epistle? It's amazing. Sorry, John's gospel. John chapter 12, verse 37. But so he had performed so many signs before them, yet they were not believing. They would not believe that the word of Isaiah the prophet might be fulfilled. Lord, who has believed our report, which I have a kind of be in Isaiah 53, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For this cause they could not believe. Because they would not, they could not. But then in verse 40, he has blinded their eyes, in verse 40, and hardened their hearts, lest they should see with their eyes, and perceive with their heart, and be converted, or turn to me, and I feel them, in verse 40. From Isaiah 6 and So it goes, they would not believe, they could not believe, and ultimately, they should not believe. And in the Greek text, it uses the subjunctive. That word rest in English. In the original Greek, it indicates the subjunctive mood. The subjunctive mood is very important in Greek. It doesn't mean much in English. We have it, I think, but it doesn't mean anything in our language. Greek is very important. It conveys doubt. Lest they turn to me. It's possible you'll turn to me. It's possible you'll get saved. But it's very unlikely it's going to happen. It's so unlikely you may not even think about it. You know what I mean? It, 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 it's possible. It's possible. It's possible, you know, that, 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 uh, Saddam Hussein is going to repent of his sins and become a Christian. It's possible. 
But if it's a jumping, it's not very likely. Don't hold your breath. You know what I mean? It's possible. It's possible that the chief rabbi of his wife was going to say Jesus doesn't do it in fire. It's possible. But it's a subjunctive. Less, less than it's not going to happen. It's very unlikely. Would not, could not, should not. Therefore, God will send them in a delusion. And kings, you believe what is false. This again has it's a totally different word in the Greek. I read it in the Tessuli, the Greek Old Testament, Cato. So let's look for the basic Hebrew word is emunah. Emunah comes from the word imun, where we get the word amen. So be it. It is faithful. Everybody knows a little bit of Hebrew. Everybody knows shalom. Everybody knows hallelujah, and everybody knows amen, right? Everybody knows that. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 4. Hebrews is important because it's written to Jewish believers who have a Jewish understanding of the text. Hebrews 2, 4. God also bearing witness with them, both by signs and wonders, to speak of the oath, various miracles, and by gifts of the Holy Spirit, according to his own will. That's in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 4. God desires to engender faith with reasons upon which people can act. It was confirmed to us by those who heard it verse 3. And then God bears witness to it. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 20. Then he said, I will hide my face from them. I will see what their end shall be. They are a perverse generation, sons in whom there is no faithfulness. The same word, imun, imun. Faithfulness in Hebrew carries the additional idea of stability. Stability. Now we really get into understanding the Hebrew concept of faith. We also have a word for assurance in the New Testament, in Acts 17, 31. Because he fixed the day in which he will judge the world, in righteousness to a man who is appointed, having furnished truth to all men by raising him from the dead. It's something which is, is, is fixed, it's appointed. There's an assurance that it's happening. This idea of faith being the assurance means it's something, the same term, that it's fixed, that it's appointed by God. So we say that faith is the assurance of things hoped for, as we'll look at in a moment. It carries the idea that it's something that God has fixed, the same as he's fixed the stars in their orbits and so on. It's something that's fixed. So we get this idea then, that faith is always based on evidence. Secondly, it's based on the idea that it's something that's been fixed by God. Assurance is always based on something that he has fixed. Now, let's look for... Let's begin with this background to look at the Hebrew concept of faith. 
Hebrews 11.1 The faith chapter. Now faith is the hypostasis, the assurance, meaning it's been fixed of things hoped for. We might call it the substance of things hoped for. The conviction of things not seen. Once again, it connects faith, she says, with hope, doesn't it? Connects the two words once again. Repeatedly, the New Testament does that. Faith is always connected with hope. Hope again being future fact, open. Faith is the substance, assurance, hypostasis in Greek, and the conviction. That word, conviction, we use it as a legal term for good reason. The Greek word is elenko, elenko meaning endurance or evidence. Its most frequent usage in both the Bible and in the Greek literature is as a legal term to bring an indictment to convict somebody of having committed a crime. Somebody cannot be saved without an ankle, the elenchic of the Spirit. Nobody comes with the Father draws them, but unless the Holy Spirit convicts us of our sins, and our need for salvation. Unless we are convicted, we can't get saved. We can't have faith. It's impossible to have faith until you've been convicted. Elenco. So, faith is the hypostasis, the substance of things that are a future fact. And the conviction the legal proof of things not seen, like forensic evidence, you know. You want to convict somebody, corpus electi. You have to have a dead body. So if, it, if an abdomen is thrown up, the thing is thrown to bits, the thing is not seen, but you still have other forensic evidence that will stand up in court, right? And those guys, if those guys move the thing up in Oklahoma, some of the bodies might be thrown to bits, but there's still enough evidence to constitute a conviction in the name. So let's look at Hebrews 11.1 1 once again. Now faith is the hypostasis, the substance of things which are a future fact. The legal proof of things not seen. That's how it should be. God always wants proof. Elenco. Where is the evidence? Show me the proof. You perhaps heard me say that the first difference, there are others, but the first difference between the gospel of Jesus and religion is that all religion is based on a blind emunah, a blind faith. You need something to deal with your fear of death. You need something to explain to you can explain with your natural mind. You need something to account for what seems to be the supernatural or the metaphysical. So buy my product. Practice forbidden Judaism. Go to the synagogue. Now, the Vinic Judaism is not the Judaism of Moses. The Judaism of Moses is fulfilled in Jesus. The Vinic Judaism is a different religion. They find the Vinic tradition. That's what you speak today. It's a blind and will not. Be a Roman Catholic. Be a Jehovah's Witness. Be a Muslim. Be a Buddhist. Simply believe. Just believe. All we have to do is believe. It sounds Christian, doesn't it? My friend, all you have to do is believe that Jesus will say, just believe. That's what we say. That's what the Mormons say. Just believe it. 
and you'll have a burden in your bosom and you'll know it's true. What's the difference between us and them? The problem is, we take their definition of faith instead of God's. God's is the angel. Where's the proof? You understand? He doesn't teach blind faith. Isaiah 118. Come now, let us give you the end of the word. For your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. God wants to prove himself to man, he wants to reason with us. And that Joe Day, he was made in his image and likeness, he's an intelligent being, and making us in his image and likeness, he makes us intelligent beings. The world's definition of faith is blind faith. God requires an angel, conviction, a verdict based on evidence. Isaiah opens and closes with God wanting to reason with man. I don't say that somebody has to be an evidentialist to be saved, but I am saying that biblical faith is evidentialist. It's based on examinable facts. Prophecies being fulfilled in detail. Not vague prophecies like Nostradamus, it depends on how you interpret it. Dozens and dozens of things that Jesus and his followers could have no possible control over. And he fulfilled. John chapter 5 gives five reasons why the Jews should have been Jesus. Why right? Moses, the Torah, the witness of John, the signs of Moses, the works. Five reasons. God's faith requires a name. Jewish faith is not blind. Now, in philosophy, we make a distinction between the Greek and Hebrew ways of reason. The Greeks would say, let me understand, then I'll believe. The Jewish way of thinking, or the Hebrew way of thinking, would say, first believe, then understand. That is a misunderstanding of the Hebrew way of thinking. The Hebrew way of thinking says, God will give you enough basis to understand. But once he gives you that basis, then he expects you to act in faith. He'll give you enough to make your first decision. Abraham, I'm going to give you enough. Now you follow me, go where I tell you. Moses, I'm going to give you enough. Now you follow. The Hebrew way says, God will give you an elenctic. It'll give you a conviction. It'll give you a plausible verdict on the evidence. But once you accept it, then he expects you to walk, not by sight. For the Greeks want you to prove every single bit before you do it. God doesn't. All he wants you to do is testify the Holy Spirit through his word to see if he can lead you. Even his walk by faith is not a blind faith. We walk by faith, not by sight, that's true. Not by our sight. We walk by the Spirit. You'll hear a voice saying, this is the way walking it, it says, doesn't it? You walk in the Spirit, and how do you know if it's the Spirit? And not your flesh? Hebrews 4.12, the sword of the Spirit. Think of a pilot. I guess everybody here has been in an airplane, right? Ever been in an airplane? When you go up in an airplane... You're under the clouds. When you come to a point when you're in the clouds and flying through the clouds, and all you can see is look out the window is clouds. And if it's a storm and the pilot doesn't go above the clouds, all he's ever going to see is clouds. And even if once he's above the cloud cover, he can't see any landmarks. How is that guy flying? By sight, he can't see. Well, it's just a white of an IFR flying by something else that replaces his sight which is just as reliable, and maybe more reliable, because when you get into the vertical effect and aerodynamics and things like this, your sight can deceive you. Your sense of balance can deceive you. You get into the vertical effect of aerodynamics. You need something better than your sight. When you're flying through thick clouds, when you're flying through darkness, when you're flying and you can't see anything, your sight is no good. You need something better. You need instrumentation. You need gyroscopes. You need compass. You need things like this. Altimeters and so on. Well, it's the same thing. 
the Virgo effect, we can very easily be deceived when we walk in the flesh. When we walk by sight, we be deceived. Like a plane flying through the storm. But when we fly by God's instrumentation, which is walking in the Spirit, you believe what the instruments tell you, not what you feel or what you think. One of the main things, the most difficult things in training a pilot is to teach him to rely on what his instruments tell him, not what his senses tell him. Well, it's the same thing. But that doesn't mean we don't test it. Before that pilot gets in the plane, he knows how to use those instruments. He knows how to use the gyroscope, he knows how to work. He knows how to use the compass, he knows how it works. He knows how to use an altimeter, he knows how it works. Well, same with us. We have to know how it works. Before pilot learns to fly, he goes to ground school. He learns to use those instruments. Before we can walk in the spirit, we have to go to ground school. We have to know the word of God. This is what kind of That's what it means to walk by faith, not by sight. It doesn't mean you don't examine the test. That's a totally wrong idea. We do examine the test, but we believe the instruments the way a pilot does, instead of believing the senses. Let's look further. There is another word in Hebrew. Batash from the Hebrew word betachon. It means security. Security. Look at Psalm chapter 4, verse 5. Offer the sacrifices of righteousness and trust in the Lord. That word there to trust is batash. It literally means to lean on. To lean on. If someone gets injured skiing and they break their leg or their kneecap or something like this, they have a grip, they have a walking stick or something or crutches that are going to assist them to walk. They lean on it because they trust it. In the hospital, physical therapist, they bring the physical therapist in and he shows you how to walk on crutches and he shows you that you can trust these things and rely on them. You lean on something that you know you can lean on. But look what it says. Offer the sacrifices of righteousness and trust in the Lord. You can lean on the Lord. He's faithful. But he expects you to live by him. And he's my faithfulness. The sacrifices of righteousness. We're supposed to live a holy life. A faith life. If we're following his commandments, if we're doing what he commanded, we can lean on it. But if we're not walking in faith, we can't lean on it. It's an amazing thing. Ask anybody who works in the medical profession. That's what I studied in university. I studied physiology. Ask anybody who works in the medical profession. You'll see people who spend their whole lives out of the pub, sleeping around, doing whatever. And then they're going to die and all of a sudden they get religious. Oh, I'm afraid. I regret that I lived my life the way I did. I regret all that stuff I did. If I had to do all the God, I'd never do it. Yes, they would, but they don't want to. I regret I lived the way I did. You'll find a lot of people like that when they're going to die. A lot. Well, I've never heard of anybody who's going to die who loves Jesus their whole life and walk with him and say, I wish I never became a Christian. I wish I never picked up the cross and tried to live a crucified life. I wish I never remained faithful to my life. I wish I never faced those. I wish I never. I wish I never. I wish I never. 
You won't find one Christian who's going to die saying that you'll find a lot of unsafe people. <laughs> but you can lean on him if you're bringing the sacrifice of righteousness. Another word, Quran in Hebrew, Deuteronomy 32-37. And he will say, where are their gods? The rock in which they sought refuge. Now Jesus is our rock, we're told in the scriptures. We have a refuge in him. The thing that somebody faces in is what they'll take refuge in when they're in trouble. You can have total faith in something and totally believe it. And, and you'll take refuge in it, but if it's not true, it'll fail. It'll fail. I've had people that I've witnessed to tell me, how can you say that? I've met Buddhist people who are very sincere. I remember in Vietnam when I was a kid, was on television, a Buddhist monk poured kerosene on his head and lit a match. That was about the most sincere man I ever saw in my life. <laughs> and in all likelihood, he didn't accept Jesus like some miraculous intervention of God, a clean moment in life and death and still hurt. In the Middle East, I've seen Shia Muslim fanatics that will load up explosives into a truck and crash into a building and kill themselves and as many people as possible. One of these men died and his wife who was pregnant was on TV from Hamas in the Gaza Strip and they interviewed him a few weeks ago. And she's carrying this guy's baby and blew himself up and she says, my ambition is to give birth to a son for Allah who, who will become a suicide bomber. <laughs> Imagine your own baby, you want, you want to raise your kid up and go out and kill himself as many people as possible in the favor of his, his father. That woman was very sincere. People being sincere and even taking refuge in something doesn't mean it's right, God wants it. Where is it now? The only real rock, the only thing you can have real faith in is Jesus. Everything else is sinking sand, that's it. But in our society, that's being compromised. Even by people who say they're evangelical. I'm absolutely shocked and disgusted by the behavior of Colin Chapman, formerly of Trinity College, who was a of the state's uh, character. Colin Chapman says, I know Buddhists and I know Hindus and Muslims who can't accept Jesus. And I'm not prepared to say that those people don't have a refuge. I am. God says so. In this worship leader, you can strongly debate whether or not Allah is the God of the Bible or the pagan Arab view. You can strongly debate that. Hebrews 2.13 I will put my pito in him. My pito from Isaiah chapter 8. I will put my persuasion in him. My persuasion. Like to him, I know who I believe in and I'm persuaded that he is able. I'm persuaded. But I'm persuaded because of faith. And it's in these earlier chapters where Paul begins to lay the background for what he gets into in the later chapters. So with this in view, let's conclude by looking at Hebrews 11. Why are we persuaded? Faith is the hypostasis, the assurance 
of the future fact. The legal evidence, the convicting verdict of what we don't see it. For by it, the men of old gained approval. By faith, we understand that the words were prepared by the word of God so that what is seen was not made out of things which are visible. By faith, Abel offered to God a better sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained the testimony that was righteousness. Now understand, was it that he didn't have faith? Yes, but not necessarily as we define it. He didn't have faithfulness, you understand? Cain's problem was he didn't have faithfulness. In other words, the same thing as what the Jews did. They were practicing their religion, but they weren't really being faithful for God. They were going through the rituals. I went through a, through a funeral in Ireland the other day. And I was in the Republic of Ireland the other day. And was teaching this village in Ireland with any who I witnessed to. And I know very well from witnessing to these people that they don't know what they believe. The people I know are witnessing. I know from talking to those people, they don't know what they believe. But in the chapel at the funeral mass, it was crazy one minute they're thanking God for the next minute they're praying to get them out of prison for them. The same people who I've witnessed to and know that they don't know what they believe. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with people. The same Roman Catholic prayers, the rosary thing was terrible. Every prayer is just a goddess of Santa Mary. And they're going through this. Well, that's it. They have some kind of faith in it. Well, yeah, if you want to say it that way, but that's not what the Bible calls faith. There's no faithfulness. They go through the rituals. The same as Isaiah. These people worship me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. There's no faithfulness. Well, that was Cain's problem. It wasn't that he didn't have faith in the sense of trust in God. It means much more than that. He didn't have faithfulness. By faith, Enoch was taken up. He was raptured. So that he should not see death. Faithfulness. What kinds of Christians are going to be raptured when Jesus comes back? The ones with faith that there's going to be raptured? No. The ones who are faithful. Verse 6. Without faith it's impossible to please him. We have to define this. Without faith it's impossible to please God because without faithfulness it's impossible to please God. Anything not done in faith is sin. There's things I do, and I have to ask myself, do I have the faith that Jesus wants me to do this, or is it okay with God that I do this, or am I doing this in the flesh? Doing something in the flesh might not be sin, but when, I, when you're saying, do I have the faith to do this? It could be. It could be something that's not necessarily wrong in itself, not morally wrong, but if it's not done in faith, it's sin. I know people who married somebody that they really had doubts who they had married. A person was a Christian and said, I'm going to marry this person. And they got married to this person, but it really wasn't done in faith. It was a sin and they reaped the consequences from it. Now that's not nearly as bad as marrying an unsaved person, of course. That's just totally wrong. You can be careful. You can do things which are not morally wrong, but they're not done in faith. And they can be sin. Not the kind of sin that necessarily put us in hell, but the kind of sin that God's going to have to work on our lives to correct. By faith, by faithfulness, Noah being warned by God about things not yet seen. See, there it is. Future facts. In reverence, prepared an ark for the salvation of his household. The last days of the saints. Faithful people are going to be sure of what's going to happen. I know from the Bible there's going to be a one world currency system. I know from the Bible that the false religions of the world are going to unite. I know from the Bible that the countries that will own that fire will somehow be confederated for the enterprise. I know all these things are going to happen. And the thing that the Bible calls us to do to be ready for that to happen. But we're not being faithful. That's it. By faith. The same as no one knew ahead of time, God's telling us ahead of time. It's not yet seen. Some of these things aren't yet seen, even though they're being fulfilled more and more. By faith, 
Abraham, when he was called, obeyed, once again, his action, not faith, but faithfulness. By faith, he lived as an alien in the land of promise. He was looking for a city whose foundation, an architect, and go to the God. The meek shall inherit the earth. Yes, this place belongs to us, we're taken here. The Father certainly seems to have that right. But Abraham was promised the land. And he lived it as a farmer. What promised this land? And that's the meaning of that. He lived it by faith. By faithfulness. The <coughs> third is not a public master. The Son of Man has no place to lay his head that faithfulness. Following Jesus. Yes, it's promised to us. Yes, we're taking kids. Now, but not yet. The powers, now, but not yet. If you're really looking to the world to come, to the city whose foundations and architects is God, if you're really looking to the world to come, you're not too bothered about this world. I can see Christians who are being persecuted or impoverished, but the rest of us, we really don't have anything to complain about most of the time. By faith, even Sarah herself received the ability to conceive. That is, by faithfulness. Therefore also there was born of one man, and him as good as dead, at that time as many descendants. The stars of the heavens numbered seven of us. All these died in faith without receiving the promises. Oh boy! Name it and claim it. God wants you rich. Believe God for it. If you don't have it, there's something wrong with you. <laughs> These guys had real faith. And it says they didn't get it. Not only that, but Hebrew says they're our role models. We should be like Abraham. We should be like Noah. We should be like Abel. Where did their faith get them? They didn't get this stuff, did they? Yet they're our role models. How can anybody in their right mind believe a man like Kenneth Pope or Kenneth Abel? How can any person of average intelligence read the faith chapter that says more about faith than the rest of the Bible put together and believe this stupid garbage? How can anybody? It's an insult to your own intelligence. Even somebody who's not a Christian can listen to them and read different things and do different things. Even an unfaith person can read a different Only Christians are stupid enough to behave like a literate. Now let's keep looking. Verse 16, real faith desires a better country. Now it uses the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and then in verse 22 it gets to Joseph. When he was dying, he made mention of the Exodus. Now let's look further. Verse 24, the only place the faith chapter talks about wealth at all. It doesn't mention money one time. The faith chapter does not mention money one time. Paul says that people who want to get financially rich in this world that much are going to lose their faith. Paul says, well, how do you do it? And Paul says, of course, you're going to lose your faith, doesn't he? Was Kenneth Colton the liar? Or was St. Paul a liar? I think Kenneth Colton was a liar. By faith, when he grew up, he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to endure ill treatment with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. Considering the reproach of Christ, the reproach of Christ. Oh, that was the Old Testament. That doesn't mean in Christ we have these things now. That was only the Old Testament. No. It says Moses was going to bear the reproach of Christ. Jesus was in the Old Testament. Not in human form, but he was there. He was right there from Genesis chapter 1. The reproach of Christ, because he was looking for a reward from God, not of this world. Look at it. The only place that Hebrews 11, the faith chapter, even mentions wealth, is where it says Moses could have had it and turned his back on. He called it a faith. If you're not prospering, you don't have faith. <laughs> Moses could have had wealth, and he didn't prosper. He called it a faith. Let's look further. By faith he kept the Passover, and so did 
three kids, you got half of the land. By faith, they had the harvest. Did not perish along with those who disobeyed. A lot of spiritual meaning to write out. Long points of time. And it goes on and on talking about the judges, Gideon and Barak and Samson, then the kings like David, and then the prophet Samuel, who by faith conquered kingdoms, performed acts of righteousness, and obtained promises, and shut lions' mouths. Good. All good stuff. They faith bring good stuff? Yes. They quench the power of the fire. They escaped the edge of the sword. From weakness were made strong. Became mighty in war. Put foreign armies to flight. Did they have victory because of their faith? Yes. Did they have good things because of their faith? Yes. Good. Women received their dead back by revelation. Smith legal point, whatever. Praying somebody gets up from the dead. Good. But others were tortured, and not accepting their release in order that they might gain a better resurrection. Bad head work. You pray in faith, you pray in faith, but even if something bad happens, only for God to do something better happens, right? It's ending the game. We don't have to suffer. Others experience mockings and scourgings, yes, chains and imprisonment. When I think of Christians that I read about in Brother Andrew's magazine or Richard Wernbrand's magazine, Christians right now were separated from their families for being tortured. Some of them children being murdered right now. And I look at this. The fact that there's a bill from America with a private spot on the telephone here, three wings and a new people who suffer don't have faith. Probably he living in a mansion in southern Nigeria turned his back on a Christian being murdered in northern Nigeria, but he does it. They were stoned, they were sworn in two. They were tempted, they were put to death with the sword. This is how I always put it, you may have heard me. They went about in 2,000 pound suits from Camp Sado Road, riding around in the stage with the beast. Sorry, I thought I was in Oklahoma. No, they went about in sheep skins and goat skins, being destitute, afflicted, ill treated, men of whom the world was not worthy, wandering in deserts, mountains, caves, and holes in the ground. Frederick Price says, somebody suffers. In the sick, the Holy Spirit doesn't want to live in a broken down house. He's God. He wants to live in a healthy body. You're not worthy to have God inside of you if you're suffering. Tell that to a Christian in Nigeria who's just been beaten within an inch of his life, laying in a pool of blood at this minute in Nigeria because of his faith. Tell him that the Holy Spirit's not inside of him. Right this minute, a Christian be martyred somewhere in the world. Being tortured to death. Right this minute. Somebody who loves his or her family as much as you and I are out. The Holy Spirit's not a man. That's the second time. But God says there are men of whom the world is not worthy. The Son of Man had no way to lay his head, and the servants run above his master. They wander in caves and holes in the ground. All of these have been gained approval through their faith. Yet they did not receive what is promised. God says they're approved because of their faith, but they didn't even get the stuff they were longing for. And then God says, they should be our models. They should be our role models that we emulate. They're examples for us. Even though they suffered and didn't get it. Because God has provided something better for us, so that apart from us, they should not be made perfect. The faith life is a combination of good things and bad things. We have good days and we have bad days. The church has good seasons and bad seasons. There's times of freedom and there's times of persecution. God calls us to have faith because he calls us to have faithfulness. 
because he was there. Now there's one other point to say. Something that bothers me tremendously is when I see a little old lady on tension giving her money to a faith teacher. A little old Jewish man last night in Africa to bring money to Sorella at home to the end of the Mr. Gita from the family. He didn't get it. He understood why he shouldn't give any more money to Morris and so forth. And this old lady is sick and dying, and she's going to be with Jesus soon, and she gives the money to one of these con artists, and the only thing that that lady has left is the faith in Jesus. Her money's gone, her youth is gone, her husband's been dead 10 years or 20 years. She doesn't have anything anymore except her faith in Jesus. And one of these con men, she thought of his other thing, and says, no, you don't even have that, otherwise you're going to be sick. This is an insult to none of them, it's an insult to Christ. God is going to judge us. Then there's the gift of faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. Without faith, we can't get saved. We're saved by grace and faith. But then it's the gift of faith. We all have a measure of faith in the testament of all of us. All of us have a measure of faith. But we don't all have the gift of faith. The same as we all don't have the gift of miracles or the gift of healing or the gift of prophecy, we all don't have the gift of faith. What is it? The gift of faith is a charismatic gift from the Holy Spirit, not to you, but to the body, through you, as all charismatic gifts are. Nobody ever has any gift except salvation. The gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. The Holy Spirit is the gift himself, the pleasure of it. Nobody has any gift. The body has a gift. The gift is through a man or a woman, but never through a man or a woman. Somebody with a gift of faith is somebody who has the gift from God to trust God to things not specifically written in the Bible. We can all trust God for salvation. He who believes in his heart and confesses with his mouth, he can get saved. God will one way or another give you the grace to get through life's trials. You can trust God to believe that in his word. You can trust and believe God for anything in the Bible. Every Christian can trust and believe God for everything in the Bible, providing it's really in there. But there's some people who can say, I know that this person is dying in cancer, but I know that God's going to heal that person, and it's not their imagination, it's just their faith. They can trust and believe God for something that's not in the Bible and it comes true. Think of Anna, or think of Simeon, when Jesus was a baby. He was getting older and older and older, but he knew he wasn't going to die until he saw the Messiah. God gave, he had the gift of faith. In, in a sense, certain people had the gift of the Spirit in the Old Testament, but it wasn't through the whole body, it was certain people. He had the gift of faith. He could trust and believe God for something like that. Usually, people with the gift of faith are people who are intercessors. Not people who intercede once in a while, but people who have the grace to go into intercessory prayers the way of life. They out of bed every day at, at three in the morning and pray for four hours before they go to bed. Sometimes in the space they call the prayer warriors. There are people like that. And you see people who have the grace to do that. Like for me, it's my grace to like to stay awake all night and read the Bible and not go to sleep. And then the next night I can do the same thing. And stay awake and read the Bible and not go to sleep. How do you do that? I have the grace. But somebody else has the grace to pray for reading that. People who have that have the gift of faith. Not every Christian has it. But every Christian has it. Emunah, the Hebrew concept of faith, it cannot be distinguished from faithfulness. It requires faithfulness. Faith and faithfulness are indistinguishable in God's economy. If somebody is not faithful, they don't have real faith. But if somebody has real faith, you're going to be looking at somebody who's faithful. Who got raptured? Enoch. Why? His peace, though. His faithfulness. Who's going to get raptured? 
the faithful Christians. Noah was rescued. Why? His people, his faith, yes, his faith. Who's going to get rescued from the wrath to come? The faithful. And faithful people are going to be like the people in Hebrews 11. Sometimes things are good, sometimes things are bad. But whether things are good or things are bad, they are faithful. Because Jesus is faithful. God bless you.